I'm wanting to explore briefly today the, this next stage in Jesus' uh, journey as he's preparing himself for his uh, eventual final journey down to Jerusalem, preparing himself and his disciples. And, um, and so in this account, in the Gospel account today, we hear of Jesus having travelled from the northwest region uh, 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 from Tyre and, and Sidon, where last week we heard of the, the encounter with the Canaanite woman. And now we found him having travelled across to uh, Caesarea Philippi, um, which is northeast of, of uh, the, the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, uh, the region of Galilee, and is under the rule of Philip the Tetrarch. And Philip was one of Herod the Great's sons. When uh, Herod uh, died, his kingdom was split up uh, uh, between his sons. So it's, it's quite important that when we uh, read the Gospel, we, we pay attention to some of the minor details that we might often just read over, gloss over. That's not important where this was set. Uh, let's get down to what Jesus was saying. But if we scratch a little bit deeper at some of these, these minor details, it enriches uh, greatly the passage. So the, the Gospel reading today began with this, the sentence, now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his, asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? So we have a setting. The, uh, the Gospel uh, writer has set this uh, in the town of Caesarea Philippi. Now, how might that enrich what, we, what is to follow? The question that Jesus asks and the answers that the disciples and Peter give. So what do we know about Caesarea Philippi? What, what do you know about Caesarea Philippi? I just mentioned to you, it's uh, northeast of, um, of, of Galilee. It's under the rule of, of Philip the Tetrarch. Um, but what is, is about the setting that was important to mention, possibly important to mention? What can we glean from that? Well, a couple of things I want to share with you about this town so uh, I want to read you from one of my uh, books from my library and um, this is what it says about, about Caesarea Philippi. So of Herod's three successors, Philip had the most uneventful reign. He inherited the rugged north with its towering mountains, rough uh, 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 steppe land and broad plateaus. He ruled his predominantly gentile population with what the historian Josephus called a moderate and easygoing disposition. In the beautiful lush regions at the headwaters of the Jordan River, he enlarged Panius, made it his capital, and called it Caesarea Philippi, to distinguish it from Herod's great city, Caesarea, which was on the coast. So we know that it is mostly a Gentile, uh, uh, um, gentile population, um, um, Philip ruled it fairly easygoing. Um, he renamed it Caesarea uh, Philippi, and uh, this is partly to uh, give tribute to Caesar, uh, for um, for you know uh, who who um, uh, ruled over uh, um, the Holy Land, but to give tribute to Caesar, and then to also name it after himself, uh, Philip. So it was distinguished from Caesarea on the on the coast. Um, but there's more to it, uh, and another one of my, um, uh, my books from our library. Um, the area was scattered with the temples of the ancient Syrian Baal worship. So it had temples all over, dedicated to the old gods, the, the Canaanite gods. Uh, not only the Syrian gods had their worship here, um, hard by Caesarea Philippi, there rose a great hill in which was a deep cavern. And that cavern was uh, said to be the birthplace of the great god Pan. So previously, uh, before Philip changed the name of this town to Caesarea Philippi, it was called Panias, and that was in tribute to the Greek god Pan. Uh, further, the cave was said to be the, the, um, the, the source of the Jordan River. So again, this had uh, the Jordan River was a very a sacred river. We know Jesus was baptised in it. Uh, it was an important uh, source of water in that region, and this was the, the, the source, so again, a, a spiritual place. 
And there was something more. In Caesarea Philippi, there was a great temple of which white marble built the godhead of Caesar. So um, this was a very, this town was a, a, a very sacred place um, that spanned generations. It had the, the worship to the old gods, to, uh, to Baal, to the, uh, the Greek gods, Pan, to the, the Roman god, Caesar was a god, uh, 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 treated as, as a god. Um, and, and so Jesus takes his disciples to this region, uh, surrounded by all this, um, uh, this, this uh, pagan worship. And he says to his disciples, who do people say that I am? Surrounded by all this marble and, and temples and altars to the old gods. Who do the people say that I am? That setting uh, would have been so uh, uh, um, uh, important. It just would have set the tone of that question. Um, I tried to imagine what it might be a, 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 a similar. And I thought, you know, it might be like a, an aspiring cricketer or a cricketer who's got a couple of uh, uh, good, you know, uh, uh, games under his belt already, walking onto the, the grounds of, uh, of Lords and, uh, and going, who do the people say that I am? And, you know, it might be, oh, you know, you're, 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 you're a great cricketer, or you're the new Don Bradman, or maybe you are uh, um, the return of Don, Don Bradman. Um, it, you know, there's that sacred ground, or it might be uh, a, 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 a princeling walking in the corridors uh, with with all you know all the the, the deceased uh, kings and queens who have gone before him or her, going you know who do the people say I am? Surrounded by the previous monarchs uh, who have, had done great things possibly for for their land. Um, it, it's in this setting, the Caesarea Philippi. Uh, filled with worship to the ancient gods that Jesus asked that, that simple question who do the people say that I am and the disciples say oh you know some say you're a prophet some say you are John the Baptist some say you're Elijah or Jeremiah or, or you know one of the prophets and to explore that a little bit more um, the, uh, uh, um, Elijah was um, prophesied to return before the Messiah uh, that was a, a core understanding of the Jewish uh, faith is that uh, the Messiah would come to save the Jewish people and uh, coming before the Messiah would be the return of Elijah. And uh, in our Christian tradition, we often look at, at John the Baptist being that, 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 that character, that, uh, uh, um, uh, that, that Elijah in a, in a sense. And we know that Jesus, uh, when he went up the mount, uh, at, at, with uh, Peter, James and John and um, Moses and Elijah appeared to him. That's when Peter asked that wonderful question, you know, should we stay here and let me, let me erect a, um, a tent for each of you. Um, so the disciples are saying, oh, the, the people say you, you are uh, John the Baptist, who, you know, who had already been uh, put to death, uh, or, or the return of Elijah or Jeremiah or, or another prophet, and, uh, and so they were already acknowledging that the people saw something in Jesus that was godly. But that wasn't quite enough. Well, of course it wasn't enough. And so uh, Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say I am? In this place of Caesarea Philippi, surrounded by the ancient gods and worship of, of the, the Canaanite gods and worship of Caesar and uh, on, on uh, um, you know at the, the, the foothills uh, of of the, um, the the source of of the Jordan River, that, that sacred river. Who do you say I am? And it is Peter who says those wonderful words: "You are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God." And, and Jesus says, you know, that, that knowledge hasn't been given to you by people. You haven't read that in a book or been taught that. Um, that knowledge has been given to you from God above. To be able to call Jesus the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that is a, a matter of faith. And faith cannot, uh, 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 does not come from within. 
faith comes from God. So I don't want to go much further into the gospel today, exploring then what Jesus says to Peter, other than um, Jesus saying to Peter, this, this is a matter of faith. And uh, Jesus then bestows on Peter and the disciples certain responsibilities. And that's what I'm wanting to, to, to focus on, is that when the, uh, Peter, who's often the spokesperson for the disciples, so quite possibly all the disciples, that's what they were believing, not necessarily just Peter, when they profess that profound statement that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, yes, that is true, um, that's been given to you by God, that knowledge has been given to you by God, and this is the responsibility that comes with that knowledge. And that applies to each and every one of us. So the same question could be asked, and is asked, to, to, to us, to me, to you. Who do you, who do I, who do we say Jesus is? Is he just another one of the prophets? Someone who was calling people back to God. And prophets weren't just about prophesying future events. Uh, the, the predominant role of the prophet was to call people back to God, back to the ways of God, to remind them of, of God's call on their lives. So was, do we just say Jesus was another wise teacher, uh, filled with wonderful wisdom about God and a teaching to love our neighbour? And these are just you know, foundational truths. And I'll, I'll follow those teachings of Jesus as long as they suit, they suit me. Or do we acknowledge Jesus is the Messiah, is the Son of God? And, and that in itself is a title, uh, uh, is the Anointed One, the Christ, and is divine. Now, if we acknowledge that, what responsibility comes with that knowledge? And this is where I want to bring us back to the writing from Paul, from Paul's letter to the Romans See, for the last few weeks I've been looking at Paul's letter and tying in how that's about um, uh, reminding us that, that God desires all to be saved and God desires all to be grafted onto that olive tree, the cultivated olive tree, to be part of the kingdom, to bear good fruit. Um, and it's similar, a similar concept, similar vein to that today. But this is what Paul writes. He says, Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what the will of God is for you. God has a will for each of us. God desires each of us to be part of God's kingdom and to bear fruit and different fruit, not all of us to be exactly the same. That's uh, our, our, our God is too uh, diverse uh, and creative for us to be all exactly cut from the same uh, cloth. Uh, we are diverse. And, uh, and so we are given different gifts. Um, but you know, to discern, Paul reminds us that we need to be uh, re uh, uh, renewed um, uh, of our minds, to be transformed, not to conform to the world, what the world would want us to behave like, the, the worship of the shopping centres and the, 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 the sporting uh, heroes and, and you know, what other uh, uh, people we want to uh, worship, whether movie stars, um, musicians, politicians. Be, don't be conformed, be transformed. Renew our minds to discern the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. And then he goes on, um, uh, because each of us uh, ha has been given according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. We are each gifted differently. And I, I think these, this is described as the, uh, the charismata. We, we each are, are given different charisma, which are different gifts of the Holy Spirit to uh, bear fruit in the world, to engage with people differently in the world. But each of us, have these gifts. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. And then Paul goes on to you know, say prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry and ministering, the teacher and teaching, the exhorter and exhortation, the giver and generosity, uh, the leader and diligence, the compassionate 
in cheerfulness. And he just and this is not comprehensive. He lists off a number of different gifts that that people are given um, to use in the world to further God's kingdom. Each of us, through our baptism, uh, through our confirmation, baptism in our Anglican tradition is where we receive the gift, capital G, gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And at our confirmation, we receive the gifts, lowercase g, the gifts of the Holy Spirit to uh, go out as an adult in the church and to uh, uh, build God's kingdom. So, uh, whether you're from a different tradition watching this video, or whether you, you're from the, 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 the Anglican or, or similar traditions that have baptism and confirmation, um, we receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the blessing of God. And each of those gifts are, are different for each of us. We're each unique. But we are called to use those gifts to not conform to, to this world, but to be transformed, to renew our minds, to discern God's will for what is right and good and perfect. And then to use those gifts that we have been given in the world to further God's kingdom, to grow the flock, to call people to, to, um, to the family of God, to uh, speak out for those who have no voice, to uh, see injustice in the world, to hear the cries of the poor and the needy, to defend the helpless. Um, you know, in the Bible we talk about the widows and the, the orphans and the, the Canaanites, and, you know, but who are those people today in our society? Who are those people marginalised who are crying out for help? Are they refugees? Are they uh, people um, uh, 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 suffering domestic violence? Are they the oppressed? Are they people who identify uh, 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 different to ourselves? So who are those people that are marginalised that as the family of God we are called to protect, to speak out for, to hear their cries, to, to go and assist and to reach out and give them a hand up. So each of us are gifted differently, but through acknowledging Jesus Christ as Lord, as Messiah, as the Son of God, as divine, with that knowledge which is given from above comes a responsibility to use our gifts in the world. And so I don't believe any of us can honestly say, oh, I don't have any gifts. Perhaps we could say, I don't know what my gifts are. Or perhaps we feel a bit um, embarrassed to, to, to uh, assert what our gifts are. But I don't believe any of us can say we don't have gifts, that we are not gifted with something, a strength, uh, and, and each according to God. Uh, but each of us are gifted and need to discern what those gifts are, discern God's will for those gifts, and go out into the world using those gifts to grow the kingdom. So, to wrap it up, because I've gone a bit longer than I should, um, what are your gifts? If you don't know your gifts, how can you discern your gifts? Perhaps come and talk to me. Come and talk to a priest or someone from, from church. Um, read scripture. Pray. Spend time discerning your gifts. Spend time discerning how you can use those gifts in the world to build God's kingdom. Don't, be conf don't conform. Be transformed. And in a sense, the world we live in has become Caesarea Philippi. We are surrounded by idol worship and uh, our worship of the old gods and worship of Baal and worship of, of, of money and worship of fame and, and, and fortune. And uh, we are not to conform to that. So in this place of Caesarea Philippi, who do you say that Jesus is. And depending on your answer, what is your responsibility in the world? I'll leave you with that question and that challenge. May God bless you. Amen.